Alex Green is here with us today to teach us how to realign and reconnect with the natural flowing energy of the universe and our body. He's a body worker, somatic coach, podcaster, nervous system therapist, and also a Zen priest. Let's find our ground. Let's get embodied with Alex Green. Okay, so we're going to get into a lot of different body therapies, how to heal our mind and heal our body with things like uh, TRE and Rolfing and uh, the Feldenkrais Method and all of these other things. But before we get there, let's back up and start with the kind of philosophy of Taoism and Zen, the energy uh, behind sure. it all that kind of uh, informs all these other therapies. So can you talk about that? Yeah, well, sure. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not going to claim any expertise, <laughs> but I'll talk about I'll talk about uh, my my uh, background in it. So, yeah, I mean, what 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 appealed to me um, in my early training in in Zen Buddhism and and Japanese martial arts, well, well, what appealed to me, but also was was challenging for me as a Westerner was that there were, you know, it was it was a philosophy and a framework that was you know not you know not intrinsic to my my sort of upbringing. So so for me, my upbringing was you know, in the United States, you know, normal education. And I was very science driven. Um, uh, I thought I was going to study physics and I ended up studying philosophy and it was actually Western philosophy that started to crack my little uh, uh, mechanistic worldview mindset, at least enough that I became curious about, you know, perhaps other ways of uh, interpreting reality or describing reality. Um, than what I had, you know, done to date, you know, sort of a mechanistic, somewhat reductive uh, way of evaluating the world. Uh, and I feel really lucky in the sense that I encountered um, when I began my Zen and martial arts training at around age 20 or so uh, in Honolulu, Hawaii at Chozenji um, uh, Monastery. What I feel really lucky by is that there were some teachers there that pretty much, uh, it wasn't like I had to believe that there was, I don't know, another way of looking at the world in terms of uh, concepts like vital energy or what's called chi in Chinese or ki in, in Japanese. And there's words in many traditions, mana in Hawaiian uh, language. So I don't think I would have been very I would have maybe thought of it as metaphorical or or something like that if I was open to it at all. But I was fortunate that I had a couple of teachers um, that were able to pretty much just sort of directly show me the experience of that. And I don't know, maybe this, maybe our conversation today will lead, you know, include some of that experiential stuff. But but what I mean by that is um, I had some teachers who could. You know, part of what we're 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 doing in in meditation and and in martial arts is trying to get centered in our own body and mind and in a concentrated way, and enter a well, what we could maybe call it a psychological state, but we in in Zen it's often called mushin, the state of no mind or samadhi, uh, using a Sanskrit language. It's a kind of a concentration uh, of body and mind in which distinction between self and other kind of starts to to uh, go away. So basically a unification of yourself, oneself with the world slash universe around you. From within that state, the state of samadhi or the state of mushin, uh, it becomes clearer the sort of interconnectivity or what in Buddhism is referred to as the uh, that everything in the universe interpenetrates without obstruction. Uh, this sort of idea makes more sense when uh, the habitual part of our mind that creates self-other uh, dualism, when that sort of goes away and we enter more of this absorption or meditative experience, uh, we start to more directly experience the world that way. Uh and again, I would have been really skeptical, but I was fortunate to have some really skillful 
uh, teachers who were able to impart that experience to me uh, through their own training, their own breath and posture is what allowed them to to generate that same experience for another person. So, so that's um, that's a doorway into it. In terms of you know the overarching philosophy of of Buddhism, of Zen specifically, uh, of Taoism. Again, I mean, twenty years ago, I was I was I was still more academic. You know, I read all the classic texts. I review a lot of them now, but I but I don't claim. I don't even attempt sort of a scholarly um, approach to to describing those things. But I don't know if we were going to pick one or two themes uh, that seem important. You know, let's let's look looking at Taoism. Probably the most important concept is that there is a a universal principle called Tao in in Chinese, um, Do in Japanese. And that this universal principle is something that, in a way, is the is the life force. Although life is a strange word here, is is the is the energizing principle of the universe as a whole, and that and that all beings, humans, animals, whatever, uh, it's it's a microcosm macrocosm model. And what that means is that any any human. Uh, we are part of the cosmos. We are part of the Tao or Do, and we have the ability to uh, refine our own breath, posture, uh, and mindset in such a way it's as though we can uh, be in accord or uh, flow with the the sort of the rhythm of the Tao or the rhythm of the universe. And there's lots of things that get in the way of that. Our neuroses, our you know uh, selfishness, you know all the kinds of things, uh, distraction. You know, there's all kinds of human foibles that that pull us away from that experience. And so, any path that involves training, like like Zen or Taoism or something uh, or others, is a path of trying to uh, tune oneself such that one is in connection and harmony with that universal principle. So I don't know, that's my explanation for uh, in, in today's words. Okay, so basically, there's this interconnected energy field that is the universe, but also is us and is the other. And so correct me if I'm wrong, but behind all this is this idea that yeah, on one level, there isn't this mind-body dualism. The mind and the body are sort of two sides of the same coin. So mental illness and physical illness or mental habits and physical habits are connected, but also us and the other and us and the rest of the world and the rest of the universe. It's all kind of one currency, one kind of energy. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, yes, in a way. I mean, so there's, there's, there is differentiation, meaning so there's you know, there's, you know, what's called the 10,000 things in Taoism refers to just the phenomena of the world, plants, uh, you know, anything that you could, anything that you can make smaller than the rest of the universe and, as, and assign a name to uh, would be, would be considered, you know, a phenomenon. And, but the idea is that, uh, that they don't actually have an independent existence. There's no, there's no Michael that is separate uh, from from the cosmos as a whole, so so underlying the the differentiated experience of the you know the ten thousand things or the phenomenon of the world is a fundamental unity that that underneath all of that we we rise and fall and and as though being part of one you know one cosmic experience. Okay, and and things are naturally supposed to flow in a certain way but sometimes things do get separated or clogged up or jammed up in in weird ways and how does that happen sure i mean so so you know to me the the framework that describes that pretty well and this is not a framework that i have a lot of experience in but is you know chinese medicine you know and 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 since taoism is chinese it would make sense that that their uh, that their several thousand year uh, medical framework might might in a way match that worldview or match that philosophical model, and there, uh, 
so so looking at say acupuncture or or looking at a Chinese medicine which you know by the way is common in Japan Korea you know East Asia in general utilizes this framework at least historically and the idea that the the human organism um is is flows of energy and in, and in Chinese medicine that there's known pathways corresponding to organ systems and and then we use words to describe you know you can have a surplus of of energy or you could have a deficit of energy or you could have a stagnation and there's and there's all these gradations and so it's a it's a model that interprets human experience meaning mind and body so so definitely in Chinese medicine they would interpret the the human embodied experience as a as a unity and essentially as a flow of energy with different there being you know you could describe different sorts of energy within this model yang and yin are sort of the common ones um so we look at that sort of component of taoism uh but there's finer distinctions within that and uh yeah the idea that these that that where we see physical trouble or or disease or mental disturbance would be looked at in relationship to these flows of energy. What is Hara? Hara seems to play a role in some of this too. It's a Japanese concept, but you, you, you go ahead and explain it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> wow, I feel like there's a lot to explain here. Um, but okay. yeah, Hara, H A R A. It's a Japanese word. Uh, and refers to, you know, maybe you can put up the kanji for it if you want to. Well, I guess it can't in an audio. Uh, but hara refers to uh, the lower abdominal center. Let's let's start there. So it's a region uh, of your body below your navel. And uh, in, Jap- in, in Zen meditation and also in many of the Japanese martial arts and also in many of the uh, non-martial arts, but cultural arts, uh, calligraphy, um, you know, painting, tea ceremony, oh, oh, any, anything that would use the word do in, in Japan would probably, historically anyway, would probably incorporate the development of what's called hara. And, and, and development means that we can, it usually begins with breath, that it's an area that we end up learning to stabilize our physical posture. Uh, and, and there's, and there's prescriptive breathing things. And that's what you do, at least in our tradition, when we're sitting in Zazen sitting meditation, we're breathing in a way where we're slowing down the exhalation and creating a firmness and a centeredness in the air, in the hara, the area below the navel. When that's done over a period of time, it has a centering effect for the whole body in sort of a biomechanical way. By creating a little bit of pressure below the navel, um, it creates a center point. And one of the way you can observe that in people is that they physically get more stable. It's as though they are more rooted uh, to the ground. And in martial arts, there's all kinds of things where you you know you try to push somebody over and uproot them and and this sort of thing. And that all comes from the idea that if you can develop the ability to center at this uh, physical center, then you have more you have more physical stability. And coming from that physical st- stability also comes a psychological stability um, and other forms as well. And it it goes way back in time. So so Hara is sort of an area, you know, it's a different size for everybody, but let's call it just for our purposes today. Let's say it includes an area of maybe the size of a, I don't know, grapefruit or a soccer ball or something like that. But within the Hara is, is, is a point uh, almost like the center point of this of this phenomenon, and called the tanden. Tanden is the Japanese word, and dantian is the the Chinese word. And many people know dantian because it comes up in in qigong, it comes up in tai chi. And uh, I don't again, I, I know more about the Zen tradition than I do about about uh, Chinese martial arts. But there are multiple. There's a there's a lower dantian, there's a middle dantian, which I think corresponds to the heart chakra. There's probably, I think there's a crown dantian or something like that. But but in Japanese Zen and, and certainly the lineage within which I have trained, 
uh, we kind of only care about one Don Tian. I guess it's the lower Don Tian, it's the Tanden. And, and the idea is that by uh, bringing concentrated in a physical way, the, with the breathing that I mentioned to you, it's as though we're, we're cultivating um, uh, our bodily awareness of this. And then it ultimately, it stimulates the flow of qi or qi, vital energy in, in the body. And so part of what, uh, by learning to concentrate our awareness in the hara and the tanden, creates effectiveness in things like the martial arts. It's what creates um, um, strength and speed and centeredness. But but to me, what's more interesting than, than that is the psychosomatic effect, which is that uh, for whatever reason, you know, does it have to do with the, um, you know, enteric nervous system and the gut brain? Uh, you know, what you know, biologically from, you know, I'm not sure why, but for some reason, when we bring a lot of attention and concentrated awareness to this area, in addition to centering the body, like I mentioned, it's in some ways the, the easiest way to settle the mind and enter into that samadhi or mushin, you know, uh, exp, you know kind of shifting from our um, everyday self-object, self-other dualism into a much more concentrated um, experience of the mind. So... Uh, very fascinating mind-body dynamics at play with with this principle. It sounds a little bit similar to like in TRE, because you're also a TRE provider. Right. Um, the soa muscles are the soa muscles part of the um, hara? Or because oh boy, <laughs> you're you're speaking my language. Um, yeah, I mean, this is something I've been very curious about. So, uh, so, so you're talking about the soas muscles, you know, P F O A S. Which we have two muscles, and they you know they run from the the base the, or the top of the lumbar spine. They cross over the hip joint, and they attach at the top of the leg. And uh, so I didn't know anything about the psoas muscle f- for a while. First, I was you know I was sitting in meditation, uh, learning about the hara. You know, I was I was thinking from a Eastern paradigm, and you know they're not talking about the mus- muscular anatomy. Well, later on, when I became a body worker and a TRE provider uh, and other things, um, in, in, in the Western somatic world, there's just this tremendous interest in this important muscle called the, the psoas, or sometimes the iliopsoas, when it includes the related muscle, uh, the, the iliacus. But uh, so there's many Western people waxing philosophically in a, about you know, the spiritual center, and some people call it the soul muscle. And um, uh, there's a really wonderful author, Liz Cook, K-O-C-H, uh, who has a book called The Vital Soas, and that was written maybe 20, 30 years ago. And she has a, a newer book called Stalking Wild Soas. And she's kind of the poet philosopher uh, in the Western world of the of soas as an Incredibly important from a biomechanical perspective, but also from a nervous system perspective. There, the understanding seems to be that it's tied in very directly with our autonomic nervous system. If we go into a fight flight response, that psoas muscle is in some ways the first to respond and contract. Her her analogy is like poking a, a a caterpillar with a stick in the way that it would curl up. And, and I think that's, that's a good description. And as a body worker and, and somatic person, I see many times where somebody who's in a um, state of mm, stress, freeze, trauma, where those muscles uh, are, are quite contracted and not freely able to, I mean, they can still move, but the muscle isn't, is, uh, it's in a habitually contracted state. So anyway, so when I got into body work, I I had that same, I was like, well, obviously the psoas muscle is related to the hara. Um, And yeah, and and, uh, basically, I mean, in my view, hara is a little bit of a, it involves the the physical anatomy, but it also involves the breath. It's like, you can't have hara without breath. The two things go together. It's, it's It's breathing in a certain way that involves a certain set of muscles. Um, so, so I, I think of Hara not as a thing, but a phenomenon, whereas I a little bit think of the psoas muscles kind of, you know, they're muscles they have, a the, and, but, uh, 
my view is that the work that we do that helps people come out of their contracted condition in their in their psoas muscles is very similar. And when I've I've worked with a lot of people in our Zen tradition and other meditative traditions, and many people had the same experience that I had, which is when I started getting a lot of manual work, uh, physical release or release through tremoring, like in TRE. And my psoas muscle was sort of restored and rehabilitated and became more juicy and and hydrated and comfortable and things like that. That my that 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 greatly improved the phenomenon of hara. And so it really accelerated my or, you know, using your word from earlier about energy blockages, it's as though by working physically or through tremoring and maybe stretching in some instances, that that's a way to mechanically free up the area now allowing for for much greater energetic maybe even psycho spiritual flow yeah and we'll get beyond this part of the body uh and this phenomenon soon but <laughs> i want to dig in a little bit more um why are these why is this part of the body this like lower abdomen kind of larger region so important i'm guessing it has to do with gravity and the way we stand and the way we fight and the way we move and the way we run but this is just a hypothesis. Why are these muscles and why is this sort of general area of our body um, often a problem area? And why is it so important to take care of? Yeah, well, I think you're saying some of it. So, so there's, there's ways in which from a functional perspective, you're right. I mean, it's, you know, our, our pelvis and our lower back is what can is is what connects the the upper body the spine and the shoulder girdle and the head to the lower body you know the extre- lower extremities the legs so uh, it's pretty it's pretty easy to see that it's kind of mechanically the center uh, gathering point of of the whole body um, and and so the reason it's important or why we would want to have good health there at a minimum is for things like moving around. Um, but look, it's close to the digestive organs. It's it's right in the same area as the reproductive organs. Um, so some of the basic functions of life, uh, digesting, sex, um, moving around, uh, come there. I mean, I think we could look at the, the hips, pelvis, and, and the hara. I think we could call it the power center of the human structure um, because power in the sense of it's through that region is where any forces are going to transmit. Um, so that's, that's sort of one answer. I can't remember the second half of your question. It was like, why is it that that area gets sort of jammed up for people? Was that the question? Yeah. What are some of the common causes, uh, probably modern day human causes? Yeah. Really good question. So I think there's mechanical causes, like, you know, sitting a lot keeps the psoas in a relatively um, shortened condition. And then if you're not doing as much walking or something that has a more longer position, those are reasons why you might develop a, a, a habitually short, shorter than it could be uh, psoas muscle. Um, and so, and you know, poor posture, things like that. All, and anything like that is going to develop a, you know, a, a habit in your in your muscles and your connective tissue and your skeletal structure. So, you know, we're, our bodies are pretty habit forming and, and a lot of our habits come from what we are either aware of or not aware of. If we're, you know, if somebody teaches us to do a certain thing and we do it, well, we're going to inhabit that, um, you know, our bodies eventually are going to reflect what that activity is. But if, if, you know, if we have no concern for a certain function, it's kind of a use it or lose it phenomenon. If you don't do something for many years, uh, your 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 body isn't going to maintain its ability to sort of do that. So I think that's one reason. I mean, we're we're at a time in in the world history when, you know, most of us, myself included, you know, a lot of my time is at a desk, which is okay in some ways, but it's different than what historically would have been true. Historically, would have been moving around more, might have been doing more manual labor, um, may have been sitting on the floor, may have been squatting more frequently. So there's any number of um, uh, human uses that just have become a lot less common in in today's in the way that we tend to live. That's that's one factor I believe for why uh, we might have a 
might you know come into a certain point and realize, wow, why do I have this low back pain? Why is why do I have uh, sciatica or pain in my you know gluteal muscle? Why why do why do I have poor digestion? Um, these are sort of some of the uh, kind of physical phenomena that might show up, and and that are because we just haven't paid that much attention to our overall physicality and 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 things like that. So that's sort of one answer is is sort of physical, but I also think that. Uh, I think that trauma stress plays a role because I'm like Liz Cook, the author I referred to, I am very much a believer that that region of the body, the psoas muscle and surrounding areas it is a reflection of our autonomic state. If we're in, you know, you had a guest a little while back who a whole episode on the polyvagal theory, and I'm a big fan of that framework for understanding what's happening at the level of the autonomic nervous system. And so if we're in stress physiology, which could be chronic fight or flight, you know, mind racing, you know, you know, stress, you know, many of us are familiar with that. Uh, we are tend to be a contracted psoas and or even worse, if we are in a uh, freeze or immobilization uh, defensive physiology, that too has a, a different, you know, a different, a different muscle tone in the, in the psoas. Uh, and so so another factor besides habit, I think, is is anyone who is um, uh, facing unresolved stress, whether that's from chronic work or whether or, or you know chronic activity or lifestyle, you know, uh, or it's because of history and 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 trauma. I think those are two really common reasons why we we don't have as as optimal a function within our our body and our physiology. And you touched on this a minute ago, but you were talking about awareness and that popped into my head, Feldenkrais. So sure. can you talk about how we can gain more awareness of how we move our body? We have this sort of historical, um, our own life history of how we move and that's connected to how we think as well and how we think about ourselves and a lot of other things. And so how do we gain this awareness of how we use our body and also find new possibilities of, whoa, I didn't know I can move that way. I never did that before. Um, And this is definitely going deep into Feldenkrais uh, territory now. Yeah, no, no. Great question. I mean, to me, Moshe Feldenkrais, he was an Israeli scientist who, who developed the Feldenkrais method of somatic education. And he, uh, man, what a cool, he was, he was like a, he was a really great body philosopher but, but, but with some incredibly practical, he wasn't just a philosopher. He had some incredibly practical methods, but he, he points out a few things, uh, that I think are, that are really interesting. So, so one is he points out that compared to almost any other mammal, uh, we, we come out of the, and it's because of the size of our head and this and that compared to any other mammal, we, we have the most learning to do after we're born than any other, than any other mammal. So if you're like, you know, I don't, I, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a biologist, but, or, and I'm not a farmer, but you know, if a calf is born and the calf can walk a few minutes later, um, a, a baby whale is born and it can swim and follow its mother. So, so most mammals have a lot of their, their function developed in innately through, through instinct, basically but not so for humans. And so he calls it our uh, apprenticeship. And so we have our apprenticeship with gravity. And and so that, you know, and I get to see this firsthand. I have a 13 month old daughter right now. And so I I get to, I'm watching her apprenticeship with gravity uh, day by day, but we go through a much longer process of, of trial and error and exploration as we develop uh, and it's really, yeah, you know, your muscles need to strengthen. That's that's to a certain extent. There's there's mechanical things, but mostly what's happening is refinements at the level of the nervous system. And so, uh, before neuroplasticity was a word, Moshe Feldenkrais intuited that there must be some principle like that when it comes to learning. And 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 his view was that uh, was that as adults when we really would would try to learn or unlearn or learn something new 
we should we should look at the principles involved of early development because therein lies some hints as to what are the most productive um, modes of learning, so to speak. And so, and so what Moshe became well known for, his method, is that unlike uh, chiropractic or body work or other things that were more like, you know, fixing you, his viewpoint was, it's a learning, it's a learning paradigm. And, and his view is that uh, if you want to create changes in your, in your posture or your function, uh, the most, I guess, long lasting way to do it is to really learn that from the, from the inside out. But, but learning is different than doing a lot of something. So in some exercise paradigms, they'll say, okay, we'll do, you know, a hundred squats a day and do this and that, and kind of hit all these bullet points and you'll be, you'll be training, you'll be making some improvements and, or stretch. And, and that's true. I mean, you will make change when you do these sort of rote you know, you do a thousand squats a day, it's going to have an influence on your structure. Um, but his approach was much different. It was, can we slow things down, way down? And can we, can we, uh, so start from a quiet place. Can we help the learner start to sense and feel their own anatomy and, and clarify their own anatomy? It's like, wait, so yeah, I know I have a back. What does it mean to have a back? Well, I know there's the curves of the back. I know that in theory. His method is, okay, what is, what's needed to actually feel them directly? If you lay on the floor in a certain way, if you use your awareness in a certain way, sort of lesson by lesson, you're, you're enhancing your, your direct experience of your, of your body and your posture, and you're learning what you can feel. Oh, yeah, I can feel my sit bones. That's the base of your pelvis. Yeah, I can feel my five toes. And you're learning what you can't feel or control very well. Yeah, I can feel my five toes, but you know what? My left foot is not the same. And um, my left toe is, has, has some freedom of movement to it. But, you know, my left big toe is pretty clunky and I can't move my left big toe without moving my left, um, you know, middle toe or whatever, that sort of thing. And so it's kind of like studying what you can feel and also what's under your voluntary movement control in, in, in very simple situations like laying on the ground or sitting, uh, you know, or, uh, you, you know, in a quadruped position or, you know, and, and lots of different kinds of positions. And then it works with very small movements, you know, moving your head or moving your chin towards your knee and and it's and it's to me it's one of the boringest methods in the beginning until suddenly you realize wow the change that i experienced by having really slowed things down so much and bringing so much curiosity when you sort of have an aha that actually you 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 really learned something you really felt you really felt something new about yourself that doesn't go away like now you get how your hip joint supports your pelvis. Now you understand why your, uh, you know, sacrum on the left side only moves a little bit and compared to the right side. So through this kind of self study, um, you, you sense and feel what's going on and, and then have the possibility to improve it. And, and I used the word neuroplastic earlier and so that would be the viewpoint. And Norman Deutsch has written some some great work referencing Feldenkrais, more or less validating that that his method, you know, we used to think neuroplasticity ended at a you know or really reduced by the time we were in adulthood, and it is reduced compared to childhood, no question about it. But the 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 new understanding is that we retain much more neuroplasticity than than we used to believe. And for that reason, the ability for the brain to change, the brain's mapping of how to control things, that would be the motor cortex, or the brain's sensing of the body, that would be the sensory cortex, that there's a lot of shift that's possible under the right learning conditions. So that's a pretty long answer, but that's, that's what I would share. I want to talk a little little bit about rolfing as well. Rolfing's a different uh, kind of tactic, but it is connected as well. Uh, from my understanding, it's, I'm trying to understand the difference between 
rolfing and massage. And that's probably the common kind of question, but it seems like it's going deeper and really trying to untangle those knots and things. But I want to let, let you explain it. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Well, I mean, and it relates to Feldenkrais. So, so Moshe Feldenkrais and Ida Rolf were contemporaries um, and they were kind of friends and, 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 uh, but they, you know, they, but they had a different system, but it's related through, they have a, there's, so Ida's work, Rolf, what's called Rolfing today, uh, her word for it was, she called her method structural integration and Moshe called his method functional integration. So what was there in common? In common was we wanted a, a body that was um, uh, not segmented, a body that had more awareness, a body that had more function and flow, you know, all these things. So each of them wanted that, but they had a different approach to creating so-called integration. And, and so Ida's approach, Ida Rolf's approach, her framework was that our, our, the problems arise when our, when our physical relationship to gravity uh, is distorted. So if our head is too far forward, um, if our pelvis is tilt, tilted, things like that, then, then we are not elegantly aligned to a force that is always present. We are always in the field of gravity and, and we are always in relationship to that. And her, her belief even sort of at a psycho emotional spiritual level is that the the more uh, you know you could use the analogy of uh, say like a sailboat um in the wind if you're if your sail is sloppy or it's not pointed the right way then maybe yeah you're catching the wind and it's moving the sailboat but not as in as powerful and directive way so her her view was that if we can fine tune the the physical body's relationship to gravity we get all these extra improvements once we are like a once we're like a sailboat with perfectly tight riggings and and uh, adjusted to the wind ever so perfectly. Suddenly, we work much better as a as a biomechanical thing. But more than that, our psychology, our spirituality, all of that um, improves once once the physical alignment occurs. So. So in terms of method itself, so, so Ida introduced this concept of a line and, you know, other traditions use that now it's become sort of standard. You know, you kind of look at the way, you know, how, how does the, uh, the, the ear, you know, relate to the hip joint, to the, the, the part of the, um, the, the ankle, the lateral malleolus. So you're kind of looking for, you know, to what degree is that person's standing alignment, uh, how how well organized is it in the field of gravity uh, and and Moshe cared a lot about that too and so that was sort of part of what you're looking at but in in rolfing you are physically the the body worker is physically changing things loosening the psoas uh lengthening the hamstrings uh separating one tendon from another so it's a very detailed way of of working with the the muscle and connective tissue that actually and so part of the job of the rolfer is to see where that alignment is not, where it could be improved, and to try to steer the structure into the direction of more integration using a variety of hands-on techniques. Now, the techniques themselves, yeah, there are some differences with massage. You know, most rolfers would, would be a little bit more detailed around you know, what's happening right as the muscle hits the joint. So there, so we are working with a bit more specificity than, than typical massage. But the biggest difference is the intention because the rolfer is doing their work. It's like, think about like making a clay pot. You're not just randomly moving the clay. You are trying to create, you have a vision and you're trying to create that vision with your hands. And so that intention is always there in rolfing. You're trying to mold and shape and encourage somebody's structure to be more like what you're perceiving as more in alignment with the field of gravity. And in most massage, that just isn't the intention. The intention is, where is it tight? Let's help that relax. Um, some massage is about feeling good. Um, and in my view is there's a lot of value in that, but the intention's a lot different. Uh, and so so that's where I see rolfing being being very uh, diverging from, from massage. 
And it also has a mental aspect because in these rolling sessions, it seems very common for people to like cry like a baby and things <laughs> to come out. And I, I, it's starting to sound a little bit like Terry in some ways too, because Terry is more about like shaking it out, but Rolfing's right. like kind of pressing it out. it out with the hands, pressing it out, wringing yeah, it, pressing out. it out. So, um, <laughs> how, how does Rolfing um, and all of this uh, yeah. affect the mind and trauma? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if anybody's proven why this is the case, but but anybody working, this is not only rolfing, massage therapists it would encounter the same thing. Um, touch seems to be a, a strong gateway for people to access their, under, under safe, relaxed conditions, uh, touch seems to be a strong gateway towards people connecting to their psycho-emotional life. And, and so, so I don't, I don't actually think that it's unique to Rolfing, these experiences of, of uh, connecting to trauma and things like that. But there is something to be said about, um, well, wait, no, let me go back to nobody's proven. So, so what also what people know is if you, you know, you press in the muscles, sometimes there's a very, you know, you're working on a trigger point, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, a little knot within the muscle or something like that. Sometimes you're, you're working there and then, uh, then the person gets in contact with a specific memory. Oh, they're just, they're thinking about that time that, you know, they were nervous when those bullies were around or, or whatever. So it's, it's a very common experience that somebody's mental experience goes, goes back in time and seemingly connected to what's happening there in the body. Um, and so, you know, we body work people will use a phrase like, you know, the issue is in the tissues. And, uh, and so the idea that working through the body is a, is a good way for helping resolve, um, um, you know, mental phenomenon and trauma and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, I think there's, you know, there's, there are emerging pretty good theories about the connection of the, the mind and the body, um, as to, you know, why those associations might be there. So it's not like, you know, I, I don't think of it as such this, like, um, I don't think of emotions as like, it's this substance and it's just there. And when you touch it, that substance moves. I, I think it's a more neurophysiological process than that personally. Um, but, but anyway, so, but because Rolfing kind of goes deeper than most massage gets in the nooks and crannies and is okay going a little you know, in partnership with your client, yeah, we're going to higher levels of intensity. Because of that, there's the more likelihood to um, encounter more of these kinds of uh, uh, places within the body where there's where where the, where the body is holding something that's related to the psychoemotional experience. It sounds like a general overarching. Uh theme here is connection connection between our different body parts and our body and other people and our present and our past and there's different ways to connect but it seems like anytime we kind of connect it back together and let the energy start flowing again in whatever way it, it feels good and it also does seem to release some of that what we're calling trauma so what what role does just connection in general play in all of this? What role does connection or disconnection uh, play? Both, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are good words: connection and disconnection. Hmm. Yeah, let me let me pause for a moment. Hmm. Okay, so so connection. You know, there's a concept that comes from from psychology and and trauma work and nervous system work. Uh, um, concept of association and dissociation and dissociation is the idea that we, um, you know, that we might disconnect from something. So in many, in many forms of uh, trauma, um, the, if there's an overwhelming, if, if the sensation or the emotion or the experience is overwhelming enough, then psychologically we have mechanisms just to disconnect from the experience that would be called the freeze response in polyvagal theory. And, and, and when we go into that physiology, you know, we go into a, sometimes an altered state. Um, sometimes we numb out and, and it works. That mechanism of dissociation works in multiple ways. It can be just like, say we could, so we could have something bad happen to us and then not remember it because we dissociated 
because that was adaptive. That was a smart thing to do. But it doesn't mean it didn't happen. It doesn't mean we don't remember it at some level, even if it's not at the level of conscious awareness. So, so, so we can disconnect from experiences that happen when they are overwhelming. And we're more likely to do that the younger we are. So in utero, I mean, stuff happens, you know, um, in utero, during the birth process, early infancy, the first 18 months before we are even laying down ex explicit memories. A lot of things happen in that, in that time frame when we are at our most tender and vulnerable. That's the most tender and vulnerable parts when, when stimuli and events are most stimulating and most potentially overwhelming. And we have the least ability to self-regulate our, our experience because we, we don't develop our ventral vagal nervous system till, uh, until after 18 months. So we're, we're without that. We're reliant upon the world around us. We're at the whims of, of what's around us in many ways. So, so if, um, if we reach an intensity threshold at any point in our life, not even early childhood, where we can't stay with and integrate the experience, then psychologically we're going to disconnect in some way. And it may be at the level of conscious awareness, we we don't remember something. There's people who don't remember almost their entire childhood. That's a really common thing. They, they have very few memories uh, because of the mechanism of dissociation. But in a bodily way, there's a, there's a, there's a correlate around dissociation, which is that, yeah, I know I have legs. I can feel them. They get me around. Um, but upon closer investigation, like they're a little numb at the, at the level of sensation. Like I don't really feel them very much. There's not very much to feel. So, so we could, as body workers, we'd say, well, you're, you're a bit dissociated from your body or you're, or we might say you're not in your body, or we have the common parlance of somebody who's stuck up in their head or even somebody who's like not in their body at all, which is, which, which is a, a psychological phenomenon that can happen, uh, post-trauma. Um, so, so in somatic work, TRE, body work, Feldenkrais, Rolfing, any of these things, we could look at our job as connecting, as reestablishing the connection between the person's conscious awareness, their conscious brain, and, and aspects of their, their biology, but maybe even history, if an emotion comes up, we're reconnecting with them with that. And our goal is, can we do that process in a way that is... Um, uh, digestible. Now there might be some intensity if some, somebody might have to go through some painful memories or painful sensations or grief or so. I mean, there's discomfort involved, no doubt about it, but can we do it at a pace that is integratable, meaning that they don't need to disconnect again. And when people do that, when they reestablish connection with their physical body and the, the different layers of the, and they have more sensation, they can feel it more. And their world is not confined to only their thoughts and in their head, but there's more of them available. Then many people have the experience of, uh, we use words that are hard to explain, like I'm more embodied. I feel more of myself. I'm more myself, more dimensions of my you know, personality are here um, or spiritual language. We're more connected to, to other things. So, so I think that connection is a very important thing and, and it's, it's a pathway of just basic growth and development for humans is to connect to more of who we are and maybe even more of who's around us and maybe even more of going back to our Taoist thing, maybe even more of the universe as a whole. And this is now echoing back to Feldenkrais and even the Zen stuff. Um, but it seems like speed, our speed of movement, our speed of life, our busyness, um, for example, how fast we jam down a meal or walking or we pack up our schedules full of things. These are um, clear, easy ways to distract ourselves by moving fast and by moving in a lot of random directions and um, just keep moving, keep moving, never sitting still, never right. getting the silence, never getting all of that. Uh, that seems to be creating an extra level of disconnection. And so Feldenkrais kind of touched on this, but all, and so did the Buddhists and all that, that slowing down and even sitting in almost stillness, but just, or just very gentle movement that will right. start opening things up. So, um, how, how does speed play a role in all of this? Yeah. Well, well said. I think, I think there's sort of two aspects of it. Um, one is one, one component of speed is that we're just literally in a different, um, it, when we're in a speedy mode, 
we are using our sympathetic nervous system. Now, our sympathetic nervous system isn't a bad thing. We need it. We need it tons. We, we definitely need it in stressful and demanding situations, but we need it when we need to focus on something. We need it when we need to generate excitement about something. So, so um, I don't like it when the sympathetic nervous system is made, is called the fight or flight nervous system, because it's not. It is, it, 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 we use the sympathetic nervous system in fight or flight, but there's many other situations where the sympathetic arousal comes to play. But if we are only in a sympathetic arousal state, there's just known things like our muscles are tighter when we have more sympathetic tone. That's just a physiological fact. Um, we are, our thoughts move more quickly when we are in a, a, when we have more sympathetic arousal in the nervous system, that's a physiological fact. Um, thoughts moving quickly is maybe good if you're sort of solving a complex problem, but but it's thoughts moving quickly isn't as good when you are wanting to say contemplate something or or arrive you know most of us have the experience of you know there's our kind of our first blush answer to something and then there's there's what we might say if we if we upon further reflection i mean how many times have you answered an email off the cuff maybe especially if it sort of made you a little mad in a work situation and then later you thought, man, if I just waited a day and settled, then I would have said something differently, right? So, so there's many instances of where if we if we aren't operating from our the mind that that corresponds to sympathetic arousal, that different aspects of ourselves, calmness, wisdom, reflection, uh, a balanced point of view, some of those things sort of tend to arise when we're in a calmer physiology. So, so to me, that's one element of why slowing down is, is important. It's not, and it's not that being speed, speedy is great in many times. We just, it shouldn't be all the time. And even from a you know, disease perspective, if we're overusing our sympathetic nervous system, then we're underusing our parasympathetic nervous system, and then we're not as healthy. We get more stress-related diseases, our organs break down more quickly, you know, all those kinds of things. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, lot to recommend uh, cultivating more, more uh, balance between the speedy parts of our nervous system and the slower and calmer parts of our nervous system. Um, so that was sort of, sort of one answer is um, about slowing down I'm trying to, now I'm, I'm blanking on my second, I had a second thought and I don't want to lose it. Something about slowing down, slowing down the thoughts. I don't know. Yeah, it'll, it'll uh, come back if it's important. Yeah. Oh, oh man. I missed the, missed yeah. all the good stuff. No, you gave yeah. me a lot of good stuff. <laughs> um, uh, now I, now I lost my thoughts. <laughs> no. um, I, I'm, I'm going to do another interview with a guy named uh, Srini Pillay and he talks about this, needing to unfocus. So the world we're living in is about focus, focus, focus. That's about speed, you know, uh, getting things done. And then we unfocus and we relax. So it sounds exactly um, like that. But when you unfocus, that's when you start to step away from your your habits and your instincts and possibilities open up and you, that's where becoming and actual uh, new versions of you emerge. And I think uh, Roshi was talking about this too. That was another one of the the thinkers that you've that has influenced you, right? How does um how does all this stuff we're talking about connect with our perception of possibility and our ability to find new possibilities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it's I think you're onto something important um, about focus and 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 unfocusing, changing our perception. Um, and I, and it reminds me of a couple of things. So, so, um, I guess I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start with Moshe Feldenkrais. Part of the Feldenkrais method is, is we're a little bit learning, learning sort of different dimensions of what it means to pay attention. And, and one mode of paying attention is what he refers to as exclusive attention. And, and exclusive means we're paying attention to something in exclusion of other things. So let's say I'm trying, I'm doing a Feldenkrais lesson. I'm trying to understand my knee more specifically, maybe because my knee is injured, which was how he got started in the entire method. Um, 
So naturally speaking, I would first focus my attention to the knee to learn to set, see if I can find it in my awareness, observe what it feels like when it moves, see if I can imagine the shape of the joint as it moves. That would be the use of, of my exclusive attention system. Um, but his, his method is that there's often value in that kind of focused attention, but equally, if not more important, is to then return to something that he terms inclusive attention. And inclusive attention is non-focused attention. And, and so in the body, even if we did something where we were first using exclusive attention, paying attention to the knee, then later on, we would start to, we would, he, the, in his guidance of the lesson, there'd be all these questions about, okay, as you move your knee, what's happening in your hip? What's happening with your breath? Do your eyes do anything when your knee moves? What's happening in your left foot? It's almost like just bringing your attention to bringing it further away from that area of focus and asking you, is there any relationship between those? Is there any relationship between your knee and your breath, even though you weren't paying attention to it? And usually, if you, if you learn to shift your attention that way, in fact, there is a relationship and that there's a relationship. So you're, so you're cultivating a more inclusive attention where as though you're able to perceive the whole rather than the part. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of traditions that, that, that look at this distinction between focus, you know, part versus whole definitely comes up in Zen. Uh, there's a, there's a really cool, uh, uh, Zen text written by a, a Zen master who was, um, Takuan, who is writing to a swordsman in, I don't know, 16th century, something like that. It's, but it's, it's called the, uh, I never can remember the English translation. It's like the record of immovable wisdom or something, but Furochi Shimyoroku is the Japanese title of the, of the text, fairly short text. And it's basically talking about how uh, it's, so it's a Buddhist talking to a swords person saying that the swordsman already understands Buddhism, but they just need to look at it from a different way. And what he's saying is that when you when you're a sword, when you're doing swordsmanship, if you pay if you if you pay attention to the details, you know, the the opponent's foot, if you try to match their speed, if you if you reduce your field of awareness to any one component, then then the opponent ha then that's the opening for the opponent to beat you. And so his his perspective is that that getting to the highest levels of swordsmanship is learning the ability to not get fixated, not that's not to not notice detail, but to not get stuck or form fixations. And so it's it's encouraging a frame of mind that perceives the world around but doesn't attach or get stuck on. Uh, and, and then the, the, the author's point of view is that's the same frame of mind that's being cultivated in, in Buddhist practice. Uh, so anyway, so, so I, I like the idea that if we, or, you know, the other example that, that comes up a lot is, is Eastern perspectives on art versus Western perspectives on art. And, and the I, idea, and, you know, many people talk about this, that in most Western art, the, the foreground, the subject of the, you know, the drawing itself is the, is the art. And we don't even think about the background, but in Japanese aesthetics, there's a concept that the the unfilled space or or that the interaction between the you know the what's obvious and then the background that that the interplay between between the focus and the field is where the you know the intention of the art is emerging from so so i think there's a habit of mind thing where there from that eastern cultures they're a little bit more organized around a diffuse attention um, than is than it's at least is what's most common in, in Western traditions. There also seems to be, I'm looking at this picture behind you, and it reminds me also in the art, there seems to be more of a kind of flow, more curvy lines and things like that. And uh, I'm not an artist, but what role does sort of this flowing of movement even it's not even just the art but like how we how we write how we walk how we sit um it seems like 
the more there's kind of this natural like flow, not these rigid lines and yeah. sudden turns and things, then that that seems to uh, feel better and also look better and uh, lead to a better life. But uh, phew, let's see what you have to say. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a, g- a good point. Um, I mean, certainly, if we were evaluating things, let's say, I mean, this is true in the West is I'd say just as much as the East. But you know, let's say we were evaluating dancers, For an untrained dancer. There might be a lot of more um, jerky movement, or 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 because they haven't because they haven't developed within themselves a sense of a detailed sense of um, sort of differentiation of their of their body so they move in ways that are more you know jerky and 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 stiff and because of their apprenticeship to use to use Moshe's word they haven't studied anything differently than that so so but the idea and this comes a lot from the the Japanese or a Zen perspective on on arts you know like let's use the 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 ink painting behind me as an example, like using, using, uh, brushwork, uh, in some ways what you're, when you're okay in Western world, we're often looking at, well, what's being symbolized? What's the meaning? What's being expressed? Okay. Valid. I mean, that's a valid thing to be gesturing towards, uh, in art, but, but that isn't really, that's, that's really not the intention of, um, of Zen art anyway, and, and probably, you know, more, more generally the, the intention of Zen art is you, you would look at a painting and your evaluation wouldn't be what's the meaning of it. It would be, what's the, what's the mind, body, and posture that created that? Can I feel through that piece in my own body? Can I feel the type of embodiment or presence that created that? And so, so it's a, it's a different purpose. The purpose of Zen art is different than the Mona Lisa. It's a different intention. Um, and so in Zen art, it's like, you know, through the cultivation of, you know, mind, breath, posture, refinement, then the idea is that then that shows up on the, the, the artwork and it's not restricted to painting. If you read the words of somebody uh, and you, and you, and you had a feel for it, if you, if you tasted the food of somebody, um, the the Japanese concept would be if you're if you are developing your perception and your awareness, it's as though you you can sense who's behind that. What's the integration of their mind, body, and posture? And so, in terms of like fluidity, things like that, yeah, I think I think I think when we study the body, when we get curious about um, refining our awareness of our physical, our body, and our breath, and things. Then, then it is softness, but not only that, strength emerges, softness can emerge, fluidity can emerge, efficiency can emerge. There's a number of qualities that might emerge for somebody who has studied those things. And I was um, reflecting back to that whole harder idea too. If in Japanese or if in Japan in some cultures, the self is more uh, in the harder area and the whole larger organism, also uh, connected right. with each other, is more collective kind of self, then sure. uh, you're going to move differently than if in the West you think the self is up here in the head and that this is this is right. your identity, then you're going to think, oh, what's right. the meaning of it? What is it? You know? So I think it goes right. back to the whole overall just way of looking at who we are. I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, and, and you're right. Like, um, it, it, to me, it's funny. It's actually funny that, that, that the, it's a funny thing that you're, that the that the habits and biases of your culture, like language, the things that are common sense, like well, where is the eye? Well, in in Western culture, you would probably point here. Um, in Japanese culture, you, you might point here, but, but probably more likely you'd point to the the hara. And 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 to me, it's so funny that if your habit, if your default assumption. Is that the where am I? Where's the where's the subject of my experience? If it's here versus here versus the hara, um, okay. And you're pointing from your head to your belly, going lower and lower, basically. Head, the hara to the belly. If that's where we where we, it, to me, it's sort of amazing that 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 it changes it changes how we move, it changes how we think, and it changes how we feel. And it's also included in the language, you know, this, this word hara comes up in a lot of words and ki or chi in Japanese, yeah. that comes up in a lot of words like, like byoki disease or uh, even kibun feeling or 
um, ganky, I'm happy. Or sure. uh, yeah. even when people are having sex, they say kimochi. I have chi. <laughs> like, right. I, maybe that's the wrong translation, but it's, <laughs> I have chi. Give me chi. I don't know. I was like, whoa. Right. That's like how people talk when they're having sex even. Right. I, I don't know. I'm not Japanese. Yeah, but, no. um, yeah, it's everywhere. No, it lets you know how how ingrained it is in the language. No, I totally agree. Or or like the the Japanese phrase for um, like getting angry is like your hara stood up. You know the 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 the, the Western equivalent. Like I lost my head. Right would be the description, but but the Japanese equivalent, and you can look this up, is yeah, it's the but the hara stood up. So it says that you didn't you didn't remain. You, you didn't remain anchored in the hara and therefore you got, you got angry. So, so the, these, these phrases are speaking to what, what's happening at the body level. Yeah. I want to get into some, some practical, sorry, ah, slow down. I, I get too excited sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, I want to, editing sucks on these parts. I hate editing these parts. <laughs> Don't edit so, it. Um, let it, let it ride. Yeah. yeah but, um, <laughs> Uh, going, let's get back to the body though. I know the body is the mind, but right. some, some of our basic behaviors that we do every day are sitting, walking, standing. Um, you're raising a child now yourself. So, uh, you're probably thinking deeply about this. How am I going to kind of teach my child how to, how to stand, how to walk, how to, um, well, move? no, I'm not, I'm what, not. What, what are some of the tips with these same tips we need? So right. what are your kind of basic, what are some basic things? that action steps we can take away um, from all of this? Yeah. Well, okay, good. Well, I guess I'm going to give one answer for little children and maybe another answer for, you know, adults. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I'm raising my daughter, Lily. She's 13 months. And at this stage, no, it's, I'm not trying to shape her, exp- you know, she doesn't need any, she's in that rich, rich, natural learning phase that Moshe was, was, uh, referencing. Um, and so there's not a lot I can offer her on, on that, but what I can offer her is, 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 um, a lot of opportunity and variety. So something we're conscious of is, you know, that she's not just sitting around in a, you know, I feel some babies I feel sorry for. They're just sitting around in like, I don't even know what it's called, but these little like walker things where they're standing a little, there's a circle around them and they've got all these toys in front of them. And, and they just, you know, then they're stimulated by the toy, but they're, they don't move as much because they're just in, and they're also, they're, they're not supporting their own weight because they're, they're kind of held up in this sort of like a walker. Um, yeah. I mean, spending a little time like that is fine, but if you're spending but but my view is for children is that that's not that great. They should be they should be crawling and moving and climbing and exploring and and eating um uh, and uh, getting a lot of sensory experience without reducing without reducing that. Um, so that's sort of that's sort of uh, my view now. Once she becomes older, uh, and my wife she's also a she's a Rolfer, she's also a Feldenkrais person my wife's father is a Feldenkrais practitioner we've got like like if if our child ends up like not <laughs> moving well it's going to be like uh what the heck is wrong with this family they had they had everything going for them um so not not to put any pressure on on Lily but uh, so, you know, when she gets older, I think we'll continue that idea of providing, uh, opportunities. I, I think to me, something that I, in terms of physical things, um, you know, unless she hates it, I'm going to, I'm going to expose her to martial arts at a pretty young age. Um, I'm going to give her the opportunity to do probably Aikido, Judo, um, maybe Karate, maybe Taekwondo, you know, what we'll to sort of look around and see what she resonates with. Um, and, you know, if she likes it, she can stay with it. But I, but I at least want to give her a bit of a foundation and something that uses her body, uses her voice, uses her, you know, develops a little bit of a uh, fighting spirit, um, <laughs> those kinds of things. So, so, and I think our parenting attitude is we're not going to, we're not going to force things on her, but we're going to provide her opportunities and see what she, her own inclinations are. Um, so that's one thing, but for, for adults, uh, you know, we're not in that same amazing neuroplastic period as children are. 
And so, so, you know, if we want to develop true expertise in something like, uh, you know, ballet or martial arts or something, well, the best scenario is, or music, you know, the best situation is we start when we're young, but, but, uh, most of my, I mean, for myself and most of my work with my clients is about, well, what can we do as adults? And to me, there's so many things, um, <laughs> so many things we can do. Uh, I think that almost anything can be a, a valuable gateway to studying embodiment. Um, maybe you get into belly dance. Maybe there's this thing called ecstatic dance, which I think is a pretty cool embodiment practice. Um, maybe you maybe you get curious about Feldenkrais method, and you can get past that initial period where it's you know feels like paint is drying. Uh, I think going through the Rolfing 10 series, uh, I don't know anybody who's regretted going through that journey. It's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of an investment time and money. And sometimes there's, you know, there's some sessions that can be a little uncomfortable, but that's a pretty cool way to directly experience um, your body. So I, I don't, I don't really think there's only one pathway but 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 I think there's many pathways to bring some conscious curiosity towards the body that supports you that 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 you know is the platform of your biological existence, and um, you know bring curiosity to it, and from there, uh, uh, to me, good things tend to arise. It seems like the more the more of our body, our entire body, we use, and our mind we're using at the same time most likely the better of course if you want to just draw that's fine but it seems like what you're saying is the more you're engaging your entire organism the overall um yeah well i mean there's ref i mean drawing is a good example like um you know drawing uses your whole i mean anything uses your whole body reading sitting at the computer you know scrolling on your phone use uses your whole body you might not be a you know aware of that um I think, I mean, my view, I think if you've never done it, something that's more explicitly about that, that's a broader attention than, than just your thoughts and just your perception, I think is, is healthy. I mean, I think we learn a lot through that. Um, I think that, you know, coming back to TRE, TRE is something that I think that kind of like everybody should experience at least once. It's really accessible. Um, and it's, it's, it's TRE is tapping into an innate, um, reflex mechanism that creates a trembling or a vibration in your body. And, and the reason I think any, everybody should experience that is because you'll realize, uh, wow, uh, I didn't even sort of know that this, it sort of shows you what's going on under the hood, under the hood of your conscious awareness and sort of recognizing that, wow, your body can do some some mysterious have some amazing movements and sometimes that connects to um emotions in the same way we talked about with rolfing uh so in terms of a low hanging fruit like if somebody was just like well you know i've i've spent most of my life thinking about my mind and i'm starting to get curious about the body maybe i'd start with tre it's sort of like if you're kind of like want a fast bang for your buck <laughs> that, that's maybe the tool that i would reach for uh, and there's, you can find it online. There's, there's free, free videos. And, um, uh, and then of course there's people who can help you with it, but that's, 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 that's one that I recommend a lot. You also mentioned martial arts and I've never done it. I'm a little scared of it, but I know I should do it. Um, what's special about, uh, martial arts and why is it, um, something you specifically, um, thought about for your daughter? Yeah, um, uh, there's so many good things about the martial arts. I mean, it teaches you about your body. That's for sure, right? Because you have to be stable. You have to be in, in. Well, I mean, there's a lot of different martial arts, but it uh, ones that involve another person, like aikido or judo or kendo or whatever. Um, you you develop the ability to be in in coordination with somebody, right? So you're syncing up of your movements. Uh, it helps you learn to not just focus on yourself because you're in relationship. So that sort of harmonization uh, would be one component of it. Uh, the other thing that I think is good is that, um, and again, it, depending on the particular martial art, um, you know, it, 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 it uses our sympathetic nervous system, our, our, 
what I said earlier, I don't want to call the fight or flight nervous system, but it it teaches us that that energy, our sympathetic nervous system, that it's uh, that that's what creates um, attention or focused attention. It what it's what gives us um, you know uh, I don't know I guess maybe the courageousness in the face of an opponent. St- you know, sort of stand con- confronting a a stressor rather than sort of running away. And I think it also. Sh- it, Martial arts is a context where we can sort of like become friends with our sympathetic nervous system, uh, and and in a way that it it um, uh, we can be relaxed, develop more relaxation, even though there's uh, activity. That's not a very good ex- explanation, but I'll, I'll give an example. When I, so when I was twenty, and I wanted to study Zen, and I was all interested philosophically. But then my the the teacher said, "Well, you should go. You should what you should do is study kendo. Kendo is sparring with bamboo swords." Um, and I thought, "Well, that looks scary as shit. Um, uh, why why would I want to do that?" Um, and but I sort of did it, and I hated it at first because it was it was so confrontational. And and in kendo, you, it's not it's not all flowing like Aikido, where you're just, it's like, no, if they attack you, you attack them faster than they attacked you. Um, there's no such thing as defense in kendo. It's just being a faster at attacking. And so I, I hated it. It was sort of like, um, and, and even though I was in good cardiovascular shape, it was so intense for me sort of emotionally that, I mean, my heart rate would just go through the roof. My breath was just crazy. Um, uh, for, for the first, you know, like month or two, uh, and it, and it was overwhelming in a way, but, but then after I habituated to that, what I learned from it was later I could, that even th- the intensity was there, but I didn't have to get as revved up. My, I could keep my breath, um, stable. I could feel more confident in, in my movement. So what emerged from that training was that I, um, you know, I, I had more calmness and stability than I than I would have otherwise. So that to me, that's one good thing. I don't think everybody needs to go through that process by any means, but it's but I think there's value in it. You've also got this. This is kind of a different topic, but it's not really. It's kind of the same. Um, maybe. Yeah. Um, you've got this sort of deep, like wide, like <laughs> I don't know how to explain your voice. You've got this. You've got this like voice that comes from down here and I got this big high shrilly voice and can people change their voice and how does how does maybe did you, did your voice change along this whole journey how did you get this like like full body yeah, voice yeah, like resonant. and yeah, how yeah. does that how does that relate to all this you know really really actually an interesting question for me because because I think that that was um this comes back to the idea of of hara so so um one way to know if somebody has done some training about Hara is, is, I mean, you can see it in their movement, but, but voice is an indicator. And, you know, you know, some, you know, sometimes I'm centered and my voice and it's, it's coming from, you know, in me. And that's when I'm in a more relaxed way and I'm in contact with my Hara. And and then it's, and, and so the resonance of my voice includes all of that. Uh, sometimes I'm, stressed and you know my voice catches or if i'm anxious and it it maybe gets gets tight up in my throat so that those kinds of things can still happen but but very much a part of our training in the in the martial arts we do we do all this shouting it's called a ki uh in in you know they do it in karate they do it in kendo all the shouting and 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 in the, when you're a beginner you do all the shouting and your voice gets hoarse and you lose your voice um and what your teachers keep telling you is uh, is that it needs to come from your hara. It needs to come from your hara. It needs to come from your hara. And you can hear that your teachers can do it because you can tell, you can feel it. And and you can feel that you can't do it. And that's frustrating. But you sort of sense that there's something nice. There's something aspirational about um, that it would feel good to be able to do that. And so that's kind of a little bit what keeps you going. And then in our Zen practice, we also do chanting practice, um, okyo. And in, in our style, you know, there's meaning to it. You know, it's the sutras, but that's like 1% of the importance of it. We do the chanting as a physical practice and it's the same thing. You start out in the beginning and you're, and you have to chant loud 
and you have to, and they, you keep getting, you know, sort of reprimanded if, you know, you're trying to get more of it to come from your hara. Um, and then over time, you'll learn that your whole body can be what generates the sound centered at the hara, but your whole body is the instrument, not just your vocal cords. So, so, so it is very, voice is something that gets, is a part of the Zen training that I'm referring to. And, and your story is funny because, um, I, and I don't know if I shared this with you or not, but my, when I first met my bodywork teacher, uh, it was, it was because of his voice. And I'll share the story really quickly, which was that, you know, I'd been doing my Zen training for about five, six, seven years, something like that. And there was a guy and he was, and you read, cause I recommended to you Dub Lee's book, the, the Zen body therapy um, book that you read. And one of his students was a guy named Everett Ogawa and Everett, Everett was my primary bodywork teacher and based in Chicago. And he'd been a big part of the dojo training and he had lived and I'm sorry, he had studied with Dub, but then he had kind of gone off on his own. So I didn't know him at all after, you know, over eight years of being, you know, pretty involved in all this training. When, when my dad moved to Wisconsin to start a um, Zen center there, uh, which is pretty near to Chicago, one day I got a voicemail uh, from somebody I didn't know, and it was this guy named Everett. And it was just a simple voicemail. Hey, I'm Everett. Uh, you don't know me, but I know your parents. I go way back. Hey, uh, I found you on the internet. Can you have them give me a call? And, and okay, pretty like mundane message. But I, I listened to this voicemail like three or four times because what because I was like, wow, like man, that voice like is like that guy is like deep in his center, like there's something really grounded in the voice. But not only that, there was like something really like rich or like made me feel like uh, he'd be really like friendly. All of these things that are friendly is the wrong word, more like compassionate. And, and those qualities were coming from the sound of this voice in this stupid little voicemail. And based on that voicemail, so, so I relayed the message to my parents. And a couple months later, he drove up from Chicago to visit with them. And, and without even thinking about it, and, and it was like I had already made a decision, I asked him, did he teach body work? Because, and the reason I said that was because I figured he... he uh, body work must have had something to do with what I was hearing from the sound of his voice. And so, and he said, sure, I teach body work. And then, and soon enough, I was, I was studying. So, so uh, it, to me, it's funny that for your comment on that, but, but yeah, voice to me, voice is a really big deal in terms of the body. And this, this will be the last question. This will, this will be the last one. I like, now you got to go. Um, yeah. So, um, you spent some time at the Chozenji Temple in in Honolulu, right? How was mm-hmm. the overall how was the overall atmosphere there cuz everywhere everyone there must have been kind of all, you know, loosened up in the body. They've been doing the zen training, they've been doing um the body work. How how did that affect the overall um communication between everybody? Did you find that people were communicating and treating each other differently than they were um down there on Waikiki Beach? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I did find it different. Yeah. Well, so, so yeah, so that, so Chosenji Temple Monastery, that's where I started training at in the year 2000, which was when I was 19 years old. And, um, you know, I was uh, on leave from college. And like I said, I was studying physics and math and all the stuff. Uh, and um I was sort of like blown away by the people on a number of, for a number of things. One, all this work activity was always going on. Like there were, you know, people were landscaping and stuff was being built and like elaborate meals were being created. And um, all this stuff was happening every day. And, and it was all the students and, and, and their, um, well, people were like, they were they were capable. They were doing all these things that I'd never done, uh, and so they were physically very capable. Um, uh, uh, so that's sort of like a body thing. They were strong, but but not only that, you, you know. I guess maybe the closest analogy. Later, I lived in Wisconsin, and there were Amish communities, and sometimes teams of Amish folks uh, would would you know as laborers would come to help build a house or this or that. And, and the, and the comment, you know, most people would, would say, wow, watching the 
these Amish people uh, work together, it's like a, you know, like a school of fish or something like there's just this sort of like everybody knows what to do and is, and is coordinating with one another. And, and that's sort of like what I felt at Chozenji. It's like, I just entered the grounds and then there's all this activity and people are, are being, um, uh, you know, productive and there's, there's verbal communication, but like not too much. And people are like in a good mood, but they're not just hanging around talking. And, and, uh, and it was, it was sort of like intimidating for me. I, w- my initial experience for many months was like, I do not know how to fit into this flow. I feel like the absolute, you know, uh, left foot of this situation. I'm, you know, just not very coordinated. Um, and all these things, but then even at the cultural level, I started to perceive that there was this sense of, um, uh, attunement to one another, caring for one another, but not in a, uh, lovey dovey way, but just a real attentiveness and, and, and support. And, you know, there's, this is in Hawaii and the, the, the concept of aloha, um, not in the touristy aspect of the word, but in something with something with more, you know, uh, depth and tradition behind it, uh, really was evident in the culture, you know, this, this concept of, of, uh, sharing and, and, and caring for one another. So, so these are all the things that I felt about that community. And like I say, I felt like the absolute oddball out. Uh, but, but I was, but that made me mad. It made me mad that I felt like the oddball out. And it made me think like, well, I, I got to get at least a little bit, I need to at least sort of figure out how to fit into this situation. Um, and so that's what, that's what kept me going. <laughs> so there's, there's hope for, uh, hope for this world. Maybe, well, what if the world became more like that or it's not going to happen, but mm-hmm. maybe your, your home can be that way, or maybe your community can be that way. Or you can, you can find a place yeah, yeah, like maybe that. Your family, maybe your community, your, maybe, your, maybe yeah. your workplace. Yeah. And maybe just, totally. maybe just yep. your body. That's your body is like this Chosenji temple. That's, that's maybe where you start. <laughs> Yep. Um, yep. That's Agreed. great. Uh, if people want to connect with you or learn more, uh, where can they go? Best would be um, redbeardsomatictherapy.com. That's my uh, business group practice website. Uh, also, I, I have alexgreen.com also. That's just a bit more about my personal work. Um, either of those websites is a great yeah. way to connect. Yeah. I'll, I'll link your YouTube and your podcast there as well. Oh, one more thing. Some people might not know who this red beard guy is. Uh, actually, I didn't know when I first uh, found your podcast, like red beard. Do you have a red beard? No, you don't. Uh, maybe you do. Um, but uh, who, wh- why, why red beard? <laughs> yeah. So, so good. Nice story. So red beard is behind us. You know, we were talking about this painting on the wall. So red beard is, is a reference to um, uh, Bodhidharma and Bodhidharma was a historical figure that brought Buddhism from from India into China, and I always forget what century, maybe the fourth century, something like that. And and he he carried Buddhist teaching into China, and then and then sort of established it. And and uh, Buddhism, the 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 style of it changed from a sort of an Indian culture version to a very different something that matched more the Chinese culture upon that uh, thing. And so, and so Bodhidharma is often considered, he's called the first patriarch of Zen, meaning that uh, it's as though that's sort of when the Zen or Chan is the Chinese word for Zen. That's when that uh, lineage of Buddhist training uh, sort of began with him. Uh, he's an amazing historical figure, um, not only for those things, he's also credited as the founder of Shaolin Monastery. He was said to be a Kung Fu master. Um, so, so there's a lot of, um, legend around him, um, in, in Japan, uh, as you know, well, we're on video, but I'll show you, you know, they have these, uh, Daruma, Daruma is the Japanese word for, for Bodhidharma, uh, that we, that, you know, at, at new year's time, these paper mache dolls and you paint in one eye and this and that. So I view, uh, Daruma as almost like sort of like the Santa Claus figure of East Asia, because he's, he's, popular icon in, in, and, and, and many at the popular level, 
you know, probably many people don't know much about the historical person and this connection to Zen Buddhism. But, but like kids get these dolls like and they love them and they treasure them. Like, oh, look at my Bodhidharma. Yeah, they're they're like they're it's cool. A toy. Like people it's love- a toy, right? Right, yeah. exactly. So so you know, there's sort of all levels of it. But in the Zen tradition, he's a commonly um, well, he's regarded as an important teacher, and there's still records of his writings and stories. And then he's commonly depicted. So, so the painting on the wall behind me is a, is a painting of, of Bodhidharma. And anyway, he, the red beard comes in because uh, Bodhidharma by legend had blue eyes and a red beard um, because of where he, you know, he was come from the Northern part of India. And that's what they, that was their genetic heritage. Um, and so, so red beard is the term red beard somatic therapy is a reference to him. And, and that came a long time ago. Uh, and to me, he's just sort of like a mascot. I just think of him as I know that almost everybody, you know, at a passing level doesn't know what that's about. And they might think I have a red beard, but, but to me, it's sort of like, it's like an inside joke. It's a guiding, it's a guiding principle. I, I think he's uh, an admirable historical figure and somebody who cared a lot about um, embodiment and the mind and and being a human being, and so so for me, he's a good um, mascot to you know to carry on my work under. All right, well, thank you so much, Alex. I feel all pumped up and motivated to go do something with my body. I don't know what I should do. Like, I don't want to do TRE in the morning. Maybe go just jump around or something. <laughs> I think you should do kendo, Michael. I think you should. I think you should do some kendo. No, well, go go do, find a, if you're, you're near Osaka, right? Find some kendo, and uh, next time <laughs> I visit Japan, I'll we, you and I we, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll hit the dojo together. Yeah, we'll go to the dojo. Oh God, <laughs> you're like tw- three times my size. I'm tiny. Um, your your normal size. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll go, I'll go do something. I don't well, think I'll do kendo today. I'll, I'll uh, maybe do some pull ups or something more simple at first. But uh, yeah, nice. But nice. Yeah, I, I, I like I, it. I, I, I do like think it. I do. After this conversation, I do. I do uh, think I will um, at least look into some of these uh, martial arts schools or something. And um, it might be good for my mind too. Yeah. I, I'm going to stop stop this conversation, but you know, I'm I feel a little bit of fear of fighting and fear of others a bit. You know, maybe from my childhood of sure. being a uh, uh, small, being the runt or whatever. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to get over that. And I think maybe just by doing this martial arts too, we can uh, kind of get over our fear of others and the conflict and all that. Right. I, I, I think, I think you're onto something. I don't, I don't right. disagree. I don't disagree. I, this is where I gotta go. Yeah. I, I, no time for pull-ups time to go, go straight to karate. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank all you right. So much, well, Alex. One way or another. Keep, keep, keep me posted. Yep. Yeah, real pleasure, Michael. Thank you so much.